Hey guys, it's Dr. Justin Marcajani here. Today's video is gonna be on high insulin levels and acne. We are gonna dive in, and before we do, I really appreciate it. You put your comments down below. Let me know about your own personal skin experiences. And if you're enjoying the content, give me a thumbs up as well, and, and go to justinhealth.com slash iTunes. We'll put the link down below, and give us a review. We really appreciate it. It helps spread the word. All right, let's dive in. So what's insulin? Insulin's a hormone that's primarily gonna be stimulated by the pancreas, by the beta cells of the pancreas, in regards to carbohydrate. So usually, the faster that carbohydrate converts to sugar and goes in that, that sugar increases blood glucose in the bloodstream, usually the faster insulin response or the, the more of a greater of an insulin response you're going to have. And the more of that carbohydrate you consume, the more insulin you will have. So for instance, things like berries, right? More fiber, more nutrition, uh, sugar, the fructose sugar comes out, which gets broken into Fructose is going to primarily get metabolized by the liver. Uh, things like glucose, more starch-based carbohydrates, those will go to the muscles primarily. It's about 80-20 each. So 80% of the fructose goes to the liver, 20% goes to the muscle. And then when you're dealing with more glucose carbohydrates, it's about 80% go to the muscle, 20% go to the liver. So it's kind of like a little seesaw effect there. And again, things like fructose, like high fructose corn syrup, usually it's like a 50-50 fructose 55 45 fructose to glucose so there's still some glucose in there just the starches are going to have a lot more glucose so the more glycemic load right which is glycemic load has to do with how much of that food that you ate along with the glycemic index of it so faster carbohydrate refined sugar rice right the more processed the more refined the, the more glycemic index there is that's it gets into the bloodstream faster and then, of course, the load has to do with how much of whatever you're consuming and then the fiber component in there. So higher glycemic index, higher glycemic load foods, you're going to have more insulin, more sugar, more grains, more flours, more acellular kind of refined processed grains, higher insulin levels. So insulin does a couple of things. When insulin goes too high in men, you're going to get an enzyme called aromatase, which upregulates, and that's going to convert testosterone to estrogen. In women, you're going to upregulate enzymes like 17-20 lyase that will convert estrogen to testosterone. And so they both can cause problems. So in men, you can get gynecomastia, extra fat around the, the breast area. Um, obviously, estrogen can drive more growth. So you can see with high levels of estrogen in men, high levels of insulin in men, you're going to see more sebum in the skin. Right, sebum is an oil produced by the by the skin, and then any bacteria on the skin can eat that sebum, and then you can have cyst and acne as a result of that. So, insulin drives a lot of these issues. Then with women, a lot more androgen. So you'll have a lot more insulin, right, from all these carbohydrates. This will upregulate that enzyme that increases more testosterone. Testosterone androgens will just in itself in women will drive skin issues. And of course, the insulin will still drive skin issues to begin with because it's going to increase the sebum and the sebum, that oil is going to be fed on by bacteria on the skin, bad bacteria on the skin. So you can see, right, there's like this kind of cascade of insulin to estrogen in men or insulin to testosterone in women, and no one's getting to the root cause of it. So like most women that have chronic insulin issues, eventually they'll be developed with, they'll be diagnosed with PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome. The problem is a lot is a lot of damage that has to happen along the way for PCOS to be present. So PCOS is typically present by a transvaginal ultrasound and they're looking to see ovarian cyst or it can be figured out through high levels of testosterone. But you may be in this in-between place where insulin's not good, your androgens aren't good as a female and you may be having problems. Now what? Okay, now you go to your dermatologist and the first thing you're gonna see on their little pamphlets when you go in there, it'll say, is my skin issue, is my acne and pimples affected by my diet or cause of my diet? And it typically says no, which is crazy because I can tell you haven't seen thousands of patients and mostly women, one of the major side effects when you balance insulin and inflammation and, and change diet and get skin better or get your diet better and inflammation better is your skin gets significantly better. That's a byproduct of healthy hormones and healthy inflammation. So I see it all the time. And so when I have like a thousand data points in my head and then I see conventional literature saying no, I'm like, that doesn't make sense. So supposedly there were some studies back early, 
I think in the 70s that may have said, they may have showed that. And so they're kind of relying on some of these older studies, even though we have more up-to-date studies today showing that diet does play a big role. And almost anyone can kind of go back to like their college years or their high school years when they ate like crap. And then they can think of like, oh, I, I improved my diet later on. And then it, it, it got better. Like just going from junky processed refined carbohydrates and too much alcohol and grains to just more of a whole food diet and less sugar, you're going to see a bit improvement. And almost everyone has that experience. So in general, I'm kind of separating it out as a female. It's very important because with hormonal imbalances and, and high testosterone and high insulin, and that can also drive estrogen dominance issues too, right? That can drive skin issues as well. That's why doctors and dermatologists may recommend a birth control pill, right? What does that do? It just takes your estrogen levels, it jacks it up, but at least makes it even. So all of these abnormal fluctuations, it kind of just mugs it and, and decreases some of that. So you're going to see birth control pills used off-label. You're going to see things like metformin um, or um, blood pressure medications. Um, there's a couple that are used for decreasing androgens, okay? The, 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 very, the various uh, the lactone family medications, you'll, de you'll use those as BP medications off-label to decrease androgens. Uh, glucophage or metformin, and then typically birth control pills are going to be it, and then they may do something topical like Retin-A or like Differin or topical clindamycin, topical antibiotics. That's like it. And so you're not really, there's not a lot of options for you on the skin side with most conventional doctors, maybe a retinoic acid or a retinol or um, yeah, Retin-A. That's pretty much it. You don't have too much. So in functional medicine world, we try to get to the root underlying issue, inflammation in the gut, um, getting the dysglycemia and insulin resistance from the food under control, getting gut function under control, looking at the adrenals, looking at hormone balances. In men, it's going to be a little bit easier. We're looking at the same things. We don't have to worry about the, the cycle of hormones, but there may just be a lot of insulin. There may be a lot higher estrogen in relation to testosterone, just from inflammation and that high level of um, enzyme conversion of testosterone to estrogen, aromatase. So we have to look at all of those things. So it's very important when you're diving in. I always try to draw a line. Like, all right, what would conventional medicine do? And when you line it up, what they do isn't that complicated. It's not that big of a deal. There's only a couple of tricks they're going to do almost every time. And then I always say, what do they think the root cause mechanism is? Well, they're not really ever focusing on it. You look at metformin. Well, what's that doing? That's trying to help with high levels of insulin. How's it working? Well, it's decreasing gluconeogenesis, right? Blood sugar from the liver. What else is it doing? It's decreasing glucose absorption in the gut. All right, well, are they changing the foods that are coming in? No, they don't really care. Birth control pills, what are they doing there? Just trying to balance out the, the high levels of estrogen, take out the peaks and valleys. Well, are they fixing the hormones? Not really. What about with um, the, insul or the uh, testosterone blocking medications? Well, they're just trying to drop down the testosterone. Are they fixing the insulin though that's driving it? Not, not really, right? I mean, they're not really getting to the root underlying issue. So everything we're doing here is trying to get to the root underlying issue. And if you understand the mechanism, it really makes sense what functional medicine doctors like myself are doing, trying to get to the root cause. So hope that helps. If you have skin issues or insulin issues, female or male, feel free to click down below. You can reach out to myself, schedule myself or colleagues to work deeper on getting to the root underlying issue, focused on the guts, focused on the hormones, the adrenals, and trying to get the diet and the insulin under control. So fasting insulin, ideally under five, but definitely under seven. You know, testosterone, try to get it more mid-range. If you're a female uh, and it's high, you know, try to drop it back down to more mid-range. Keep those in mind. Looking at free and total testosterone, both would be helpful. Looking at a fasting insulin would be helpful as well. And you can also just look at your functional glucose tolerance. Get a blood sugar meter like I have right here. I have um, Keto Mojo right now. I got a bunch of them, but that's the one I'm using right now. And just take a fasting blood sugar and then test your meal. Do a one, two, three hours after your meal and see how that blood sugar looks. Ideally between 120 to 140 in that first hour, back below 100 in that second hour, or up to 120 is okay, but definitely back below 100 within three hours. So it should be like this. And this curve means we're not making a lot of insulin to bring that blood sugar down. The higher our blood sugar goes up, the more we know our pancreas is making insulin to bring it back down. So it's we kind of always look at that give and take, right? So blood sugar, we, when the higher our blood sugar is, the higher our insulin has to be. The higher our insulin is, the more we're going to convert as a female our estrogen to testosterone. As a man, we're going to convert 
testosterone, estrogen. It's kind of that, that big switch. All right, let me dive into some listeners' questions here. My 18-year-old has inflamed acne on his face. What natural remedies do you recommend and what can you do to avoid scarring? So, I mean, the first thing you have to do to avoid scarring is if there's cystic acnes and they're really affecting that collagen matrix on the skin, you want to at least get that stabilized through conventional medicine. So whether that's a retinol um, or if you need like a topical antibiotic, feel free and do that if you need. Where it gets a little bit tough is there was one other acne medication I didn't mention. That's the Accutane, which is a vitamin A analog. That has a lot of side effects and can decrease your skin's ability to produce sebum like longer term because you need a little bit of sebum to keep your skin like moist from being dry. And so what they do with a lot of the medications on the Accutane vitamin A analog side, they just totally neuter that skin cell from being able to produce any oil. And then you have chronic dryness for like your life. And that, that can be a major side effect. Also the black box wardings on the Accutane for depression. So I always say use that as a last ditch effort. Now I always recommend doing a high dose like retinol, vitamin A that's natural is gonna be super helpful. And you can do that for a high dose for a couple of weeks, like up to 50 to 100,000 IUs, but just look at what those high vitamin A side effects are, right? Really dry skin is one as well. So if you have any high dose vitamin A side effects, be mindful of it, work with a, a functional medicine doctor, but I would be using things like uh, cod liver oil and I'd be using things like high dose vitamin A, but very, very carefully. And I'd be getting the diet 100% cleaned up and getting all carbohydrates out and primarily relying mostly on vegetables and low sugar fruit and a good quality proteins and fats. And I'd be using the vitamin A. Now on the conventional side, if I had to, maybe like a minocycline antibiotic or maybe a Retin-A or a Differin or maybe an Accutane if it, depending on how bad it was. But I'm hoping if I could get in there sooner rather than later, you may be able to salvage that so you don't have any scarring. And then of course, if you're concerned about scarring, you know, let's say it's already happened, topical retinol vitamin A, topical retinol, not the retinoic acid, but retinol I think is better with good vitamin C the retinol is vitamin A, so vitamin A, vitamin C, and then lots of high quality collagen would be super, super helpful. And then be careful of sunlight while it's, it's in that phase because that could maybe affect pigmentation and create hypo or hyperpigmentation on the healing phase. But jump on that sooner rather than later. That's a great question. Suffer so skin issues resembling lichens planus. There's an autoimmune component with lichens have been low carb mostly, fasting insulin 3.4, fasting glucose usually around 80 to 90, good, good, good. Do I need to worry about diabetes and how do I combat occasional rashes? No, looks really good. Looks really good as well. I mean, I would if your diet's great, um, then I think you're set. And then outside of that, I wanna make sure your gut would be set. But I mean, you shouldn't be having occasional rashes unless it's due to something like a contact dermatitis if it's like a fungal thing, you may want to just treat it with some tea tree oil, but I need to have a lot more context. Also, if diet's low carb, what's the next step to getting a seriously flaky psoriatic scalp under control? So autoimmune, autoimmune, and you can do like, um, like there's some argyle soap that has like really good um, tea tree in there. There's a couple brands on Amazon that you can look at. Purely Northwest, there's one called Maple, Maple Leaf, I think. And then ART Naturals makes a really good kind of um, natural psoriasis, fungal, subharaic dermatitis kind of shampoo that you can look at. But if you if you have like the flaky hair though, you gotta treat the gut as well as it topically. So you kinda put those critters between a rock and a hard place. Address it on the inside, number one. Starve it by cutting out a lot of the junky foods. And then number three, treat it topically as well. What's your take on mastic gum and slippery elm to help heal the gut? I mean, mastic gum I use primarily for H. pylori, so it depends on the infection, and slippery elm is, is beneficial. Do you think it's beneficial or risky to supplement DHEA? I have very low DHEA, low estrogen, high progesterone, and crazy itchy neck all the time. So there's probably some fungal issues or gut issues going on, gotta look there, and I think DHEA is, is really great supplementation, especially if you need it. What about warts? Warts are a lot of times viral, so fix your gut, Make sure your immune system is strong. You can always do high-dose lysine and vitamin C and monolarin like internally. 
olive leaf to help. And then topically, you can always do like, um, get like a cotton swab and you can add like some turmeric, turmeric paste as well as apple cider vinegar and sop up that cotton swab and then put it right to the wart and then bandage it up overnight. That tends to be very helpful. If you have a low fasting insulin, is it an indicator that your pancreas is not fatty? Yeah, I mean, more than likely, I mean, pancreases typically don't get fatty. You're probably thinking of a fatty liver. Fatty liver is typically what gets fatty. Um, but if it's too, if your insulin's very low and you're kind of on the tired side, that's a good indicator you may need carbs. If low carb, is there anything else you'd recommend for someone that has uh, hydronitis separativa? So hydronitis is like these like boil-like infections. They're pretty nasty. They, they boils very painful. And there's a strong autoimmune insulin component with that. So get the, do all the things I mentioned to get insulin under control and follow an autoimmune template. Um, Apple Watch, thoughts on the new infrared feature? Could this help detect inflammation to your extremities? I, I don't know about that feature yet. You'll have to send me some info. Dr. J, how do I fix my gut digestion and heal my liver, kidneys, and adrenals? Wow, way too open-ended of a question. Go look at my podcast on gut healing. Any podcast will do as a good starting point. Try These questions are better if it's a very specific question, broad spectrum stuff. I'll just refer you to a specific video or podcast on the topic. That way you get like an hour of content versus 30 seconds that will be um, too brief. Let me hit Facebook here. When do you recommend supporting the liver? Um, typically after the guts tend to be, tends to be supported and better and digestion's good. I mean, what do you mean by supporting the liver? Most people mean like detoxification, right? So you're always detoxifying. It's just the question is, you know, are you trying to palliatively detoxify more? So the first thing I always say is fix the toxicity going in, meaning like diet, organic, cut out all the hormones and junk, get the insulin under control, get the nutrition up clean water, hormones out of the meat, pesticides out of the food. That's the first step. Because if you have detox issues and you haven't even done that, don't even worry about touching anything like milk thistle or glutathione. Don't even worry about that. Just get the foundations first. And then once you're working on the hormones and your gut and all that's stable, then you can go in and use like, in my line, we have one called antioxidant supreme or liver supreme. These are like phase one nutrients for detoxification. And then we have phase two nutrients, which are like calcium to glucurate, which helps with mold. Uh, a lot of glutathione, which helps with phase two and, and expelling toxins, methionine, cysteine, glutamine, glycine, taurine. These are all really important sulfur amino acids. So I always recommend get the foundation going and then do that stuff later. And of course, like binders like activated charcoal are also great too. All right, good questions, good questions. Let's see here. All right, what kind of doctor do you see for low stomach acid? I mean, well, you'd see a functional medicine doctor if you wanna to get to the root issue. If you see a doctor on the conventional side with low stomach acid, you're probably gonna have symptoms of like dyspepsia, right? indigestion, bloating, gas. So you can guess what they're gonna put you on. They're gonna put you on an acid blocker. So they're actually gonna do the opposite of what your body physiologically needs. Now, some people need stomach acid, but they can't tolerate it. Their gut gets inflamed or irritated. And if that's the case, you have to do other things to work on getting the gut lining stable. Um, male in his 40s tends to itch a lot after eating carbs. Is that a sugar insulin issue? It's probably more of a fungal candida issue. So you'd really want to look deeper at the gut. Uh, addressing Klebsiella infections, it depends, but if it's just a Klebsiella by itself, I, I use my clearing herbs. Usually some kind of a, a one or a, a six will be my big clearing herbs for bacteria like that, one, one, six, or both, okay? Apple Watch uses infrared light to measure oxygen levels in the blood on the wrist. Is it a good detection of inflammation? Not sure. I mean, I don't know how much of an indicator it would be from a systemic standpoint, but that's cool. Technology is really great. I'm looking forward to something that will detect glucose as well as insulin continuously. That'd be pretty awesome because then you can see your blood sugar right after a meal, which I get they have those, but I want to see the insulin response as well. That would be absolutely amazing. And or for dreaming, why don't we throw a cortisol onto that? And then you could see your stress response too, which is pretty awesome. All right, y'all, hope you enjoyed the video here. If you guys are loving the content and you're enjoying it, head over to justinhealth.com slash iTunes. Write me a review there. I'll put the link below. 
really help spread the word out. And if you want to reach out to myself, I'm available worldwide. Click down below. You guys have a phenomenal day. Really appreciate it. Take care. Bye.